When I finished training and passed my commando tests, we were awarded our green berries. My family came to the parade. I was very proud. I didn't think I'd go to war. The House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. Dave, how are you, brother? I'm fine, thank you. Busy after my um, seven weeks in Argentina. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we'll come on to that. Um, yeah. We'll 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 come on to that, and uh, I think busy for veterans is probably a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think I most people I know tend to um, not sit around even when they retire. They tend to tend to keep going, and I think that's a pretty good philosophy to have really i don't know if it's in our genetic make makeup in some ways or perhaps you know we've got that driving determination just you know just to keep going on on whatever we choose to do really you know so yeah yes and i've worn my uh my core pattern shirt in in your honor yeah well it was a choice like i like i said earlier either my ramstein tour t-shirt um which is a great passion of my music uh, or, or something more relevant to the audience. <laughs> I was going to say, we've all got a few uh, core t-shirts that are probably not appropriate, <laughs> appropriate yeah, yeah, for the public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dave, uh, I'm fascinated to chat about the Falklands. Um, I have to say, you know, they're the only podcast I really struggle to get through without getting really emotional. Um, I think they affected not just us as a nation, but anybody um, obviously that served there or that was caught up in just the massive uh, <sighs> enormity of the event and the media surrounding it. And, and um, I mean, I was 12 at the time, but I can, I can remember driving down, I think it must've been from Southampton when, 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 um, when Canberra got in, um, we were coming back off a family holiday. And for some reason, we just almost ended up in this, like, I don't know if cortege is the right word, of, of vehicles that were just packed with service, you know, not packed with service people, but but service people and their family that had been there to pick them up. And and it was just, as a kid, you uh, we were just wa waving at all the yeah. servicemen and they were waving back. And it was like, these are our Falklands heroes, you know? And of course there's a, a, a much, much deeper, um, you know, what do we call it? Traumatic story behind it. Probably every person there that I was waving to. And, the, and I know that if they're still alive, they're still dealing with it to this day. Um, uh, so going to your story, um, how old well were you when you joined the Corps? I was 16 years and um, two weeks. I, I remember when I was 14, seeing an advert. It was an advert of a rigid raider landing on a beach with palm trees. And just something clicked in my head and thought, no, that's what I wanted to do. So subsequently, I... I I focused on what CSEs, I was in the mid, we called it the mid range, which was you were not in the CSE group, but you weren't in the O-level group. You were sort of in between, which is interesting thing to say that now, um, because I think that's where a lot of veterans live, um, in between the stereotypes and the heroic archetypes. So I think a lot of us live in that space. I'll come on to that later. Sorry, Dave, I just so, popped us on pause then because you you froze for a bit, but yeah, keep going. Um, so, yeah, I, I saw this advert and decided that's what I want to do. I, you know, sort of gave up on education in a way. I just did the, the minimum. I, you know, I always joke that I got an O-level in geography, CSE grade one. 
so I could read a map in the Marines. That's always been my sort of narrative about my um, my school experience. So I joined two weeks after my uh, 16th birthday in 1974. I realised very on that I didn't want to be a gravel buddy. So as soon as I got to church, I don't want to be carrying heavy weights. And there's, a, there's an irony here. Um, so I decided I quite fancied being a, being a signaler. So I went on to do an R race course, went out to Malta, my first draft for one. And then ironically was wandering around carrying all the kit plus an A41. So, you know, that plan didn't work. Um, I didn't spend much time sat in the back of an FFR, which is what I sort of fantasized over, you know, about sitting there smiling at all the grabs with the, all the kit they were carrying. Um, from there, I went, I went on to HQ and SIGs, the sort of, um, as we used to say, the worst draft for a signaler, because you seem to spend all your time painting wagons. And then from there, I went on the mail team when the mail team was a proper mail team where there was very, very few of us at Yeovilton before Chosk, because of pre Chosk days. And um, I think there was probably five or six Marines, a couple of sergeants, kind of sergeant PW, band, obviously. So we, it was probably one of my best drafts. Um, because the senior age treated you with a certain amount of uh, um, respect being a booty and the other ranks were slightly nervous of you because they couldn't make you out. And actually, actually one of my best drafts, it really was a good draft. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, um, the corporate air crew for the Sea King started to come through. Um, I can't remember all of them. I remember Chris Petrakatis who, who died in an abseiling accident, uh, accident. And one of my great friends, um, Doc Love, who was killed in a helicopter crash in the Falklands War. And I'd known Doc all the way through my time in HQ and Six. Uh, we were, and actually I didn't realise till 25 years later, I sort of blocked that out in a way. Um, we were just great friends. We went to see Led Zeppelin together. We went to see The Who, you know, Boston on their first UK tour. He was a great status quo fan. So we went to see Status Quo together and we're there like groupies trying to get backstage. You know, all those things that, you you know, you're doing your 20s plus the runs of shop at Union Street. You know, I've got some great pictures of us absolutely hammered on Union Street, lying on the floor. Um, you know, so you, you, you do what you do in your 20s while you're in the core, don't you? Have a, you have a gang of mates who you, you go on the lash with. Um, you chase girls, you know. And you, you know, in our case, we would listen to rock music. We used to do all the local gigs um, around Plymouth, the chapel. Uh, I can't remember all of them, but there was there was a the Swan, obviously the Plume and Feathers on a Sunday. You know, we used to do you know, and that that's what we used to do. So anyway, when he came up to HQ, uh, up to Yelverton as an air crew, we reconnected, you know, and spent two years, you know, going on the lash, making a nuisance of ourselves, um, you know, playing out the stereotype of being a booty in a naval establishment. You know, I mean, the amount of times I was on Bloom and Captain's table and got away with it, you know, because my my DO uh, was 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 it was pretty good. He was pretty good with me, you know. And then in the, I got married in the um, uh, in 1980 to Suzanne, my first wife, and um, then moved back when I got promoted to the corporal get back to Antwerp in six. I thought, oh my goodness, yeah, great. In the November of '81, and then from the November of '81, um, I took over from someone called Doc Turnbull as Julian Thompson's corporal signaler. The winter, we as always, we went to Norway, um, and then we returned on the Thursday, which was probably something like 30th of March. I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but I am old now. So, and then turned to on the first of April on the Friday, and then spent the weekend preparing to to go down south, you know, the usual pack the Land Rovers, get in on the Saturday, unpack the Land Rovers, take, pack the BVs, you know, move your equipment across to another BV, you know, all that sort of stuff. It was just endless. And I can remember going home once during that weekend to see uh, Suzanne, my first wife, 
um, and my parents and my in-laws at the time uh, for a few hours. And I think that, if I recall, that's probably the um, the most time I spent at home that weekend. We then, um, some of us went down south on a proper ship. You know, we didn't swan around on some cruise liner like a lot of people I know did, you know. I went down on Fearless. Um, so we boarded Fearless on the Monday evening. Um, someone told me a bit recently that I have to be dragged out of a pub on the Monday night. A few of us decided to go for a wet, which we weren't meant to, you know, usual stuff. Got dragged out, told to get back on board, was, you know, making the most of it, you know, because you, you had three cans a night from, from the Tuesday onwards, you know. So, and then, then we sailed on the Tuesday. I can't remember much about most of my 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 focus narrative has been filled in by the people, you know. I mean, I I I and I'll come to the my reflections. I do a lot of reflection. I've always written in journals. I've got about 14 of all stuff that goes on in my head, which I tend to write down. I, I found it a good way of me reading it and then reflecting on and trying to. I'm a bit of a navel gazer, to be honest. You know, I'm always questioning for want of a better expression, you know, what's my part in all of this? You know, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm what's called an existentialist. And, and I, when I work with veterans, the way I work is I, 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 I tend to work on this philosophy that you, you can't change the past, but what you can do is you can find ways to accept it. And whatever veterans I'm seeing and families, I, I sort of try and concentrate on that first. And I don't work with, you know, sometimes I won't talk about Afghanistan with the veterans. I'll talk about how that has an impact on them today. And I think that's really important. Um, and then we look at ways in which we can make the future more positive. So I sort of have, have adopted that in in most of what I, well, in all of what I do, to be honest. But I, I, it's taken me a long time to come to that point where I'm really comfortable with that. You know, it's come, it's come from therapy. It's come from spending time in combat stress which again, I can come on to later. Um, but anyway, I went, went down south, for Central Islands, we're sailing. And my, my first memory of the Falklands and one that stayed with me is I was on the mess deck um, a couple of days before we landed. And I, a friend, Bronco Lane, who was part of the 19, late 70s, HQ and 6 pissing up crew, came down and told me that he had some wanted to speak to me up on the deck. Um, so I went up on the deck with him and we lent on the, we lent on the, you know, the, the rail there. And, and he said, oh, Doc, Doc Love's died. And, you know, it, it was difficult in a way because what I decided to do psychologically, and I know this now, as I sort of shrugged my shoulders and blocked it out, really, I think it's probably the, probably the, what I, how I was able because I think there's a lots of things going on. You know, you, you you know there's no turning back. You know you've got a job to do. You know you want to come out the other end, you know. So so I went down to Mess Tech, told the Mess Tech, um, you know, differing responses, you know, you know, typical bravado from the people that didn't know him and non-bravado from the people that knew him. So... And then we landed, uh, you know, San Carlos, which is well documented. I don't, I don't talk much about what happened down south. You know, I have specific memories. Um, you know, and I think a lot of my memories were were uh, came back to me when I went back down there on the twenty fifth anniversary, which again I can come on to later because uh, it's a big part of my journey. Um, so. And then I, uh, what happened is the, the Brigade HQ uh, took a near miss. So I remember them digging it in deeper. Um, and then it was decided that the, 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 they needed the TAC HQ to go out. And the TAC HQ was made up of two BBs. So we left uh, San Carlos and we went to Teal Inlet where we forward of the brigade. From there, we then, as my friends with Takechu told me, were plonked um, 
on the mountains, various mountains through the period of the rest of the war. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have any contact with Brigade HQ for the whole duration of the war. But we were actually out on a limb. Um, you know, we we were shelled, moving in the dark. We were bombed a couple of times, um, and a lot of that I, I really can't remember uh, specifically. To be to be honest, um, I just focused on the job I had to do. And with a small Tech HQ unit, you know, you were doing the fence and you were doing the radio watches and you were making sure everyone was fed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was it was pretty brutal in a sense but we were lucky we had a bv we weren't cold we weren't wet you know and uh you know we weren't as short as food you know the things that the 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 grabs went through you know i mean but that was my job in in reflection it's the job i choose to do you know and we all had a part to play i know that now um so and then when we went down to brigade hq for the first time is when Brigade HQ was bombed by, I can't remember if it was three or five aircraft. Um, and then we, 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 we bogged out again. We, we, you know, crash moved the attack HQ, you know, and the reason we were out there is if the brigade got blown up, they still had command and control over the, over the units in front. And then from there, we, we moved towards Stanley to get closer to the Stanley and, the night before the war ended, we ended up in a in a in a minefield. Uh, one of the vehicles, the Royal Artillery vehicle, hit a mine. Um, both the guys were were, were fine. The the uh, two nine CO had a uh, damage to his back. Inch the signaler was like in shock. Um, again, another memory. I remember him walking at walking towards me. Sticking his head in the window of the BB and saying, Hello, Jacko, we just hit a mine, you know, like it wasn't obvious. <laughs> it's a vehicle in front of you on its side. Um, so that was a, a, a memory in a sense is that we we then went into automatic pilot in relation to how we dealt with it. Um the people on you know, all the passengers, inverted commas, they they walked out the minefield, and I was the first vehicle in the line of three, I think it was, um, to come out of the minefield. The way, I, well, the way I dealt with that is I convinced myself during that evening that it wasn't a minefield. It was a stray mine and they were unlucky. And I think in a way, as I reflect on that, that enabled me to, to, to not have a complete amount of meltdown. <laughs> For want of a better expression. And I can remember all the guys when they were all back on the track, looking back at me, smiling and laughing, you know, I'm black humour. I mean, goodness sake you know and me you know flicking the v's to him you know and that's how you cope you know that's how you cope so anyway on stanley war ended so you know and i've been filled in with a lot of stuff um my colleagues i was with steve pope uh, when we've chatted over beer you know when we get together um but you know when it finished for me it finished and you know i had a career in the marines to think about you know so, so that really was my sort of um my my position on it really that's how I that's how I thought right move on get home you know pick up my life um I came back on fearless um I arrived back in Stonehouse the day after Canberra and you know I think this is a bigger part of my Falcon story to be honest and it's I think it's it's it, it in a way it enabled me to 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 deal with my subsequent you know, mental health disabilities, abilities, to be honest. Um, so I came back and my in-laws were there, but my wife hadn't come down to meet me, um, which was a bit of a shock, to be putting it bluntly. My brothers had come down. So and when I when I went back to Launceston, where I lived, um, you know, I asked her why she hadn't come down and she said she, she couldn't cope, you know, she couldn't cope with it. And I re respected that. So then there was a period of time where things weren't actually right and um, not right at all, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I just sent on six weeks leave, you know, no, you know, no therapy, no, um, what do they call it? The thing that they do in Cyprus. I can't remember what they do. You oh, know, like de deflation or decompression. I think yeah. Yeah, no decompression. Sent on leave six weeks, you know, summer leave, Easter leave. 
and a week for your troubles, I think it was like. So, um, and, you know, things weren't right. Um, and she knew Doc Love very well. So, so she was saying that, you know, she, she, she can't come to terms with Doc um, being killed. And of course, you know, you, you accept that, you know, you accept that. And gave her a lot of time to get her shit together. So, and Doc, then, um, Dave, just for our friends at home. So, yeah, of course. Um, it, it was Michael Love, wasn't it? It was this yeah. nick, nickname Doc. Yeah. Um, and was his his aircraft was brought down by a bird strike? Yeah, bird strike with the all the assassin. Oh my god! How how many SAS were on board? I think there was twenty two. I mean, it was a Sea King. I think there was a lot, and a lot of them died. Um, I can't remember. You know, I don't. You know, I mean, I don't do the facts and figures. It's not my fucking bag. bird, though. Jesus Christ, a fucking bird. Oh. Mm. They, there you go. Yeah. Um, so eventually I I caught Suzanne out, basically. You know, she said she was going to be somewhere. I needed the car. By that time, I was well into partying and, and, and basically drinking my way through life, to be perfectly blunt. Um and um, you know she wasn't where she want, said she was going to be, and then I, I went round to the parents of a friend, and they said they hadn't seen her for weeks. And then I went round to where she was playing squash with a friend, and told her to get home. We need to talk. And then she just said that she she met this friend, and it was someone from work, and la 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 la, la and all the rest of it. And I said, well, you know, I asked her blunt. And whether she'd been um, shagging him, she said, no, no, no. And I said, well, I need to meet him because my logic then, I'd had enough, to be honest. My logic then was, well, if he has, he's not going to, he's not going to want to meet me. That was my logic. So at that point, everything, everything in my life about the Falklands just disappeared. You know, I, I, I had, I had bigger fish to fry. I had bigger things to sort out in my life, you know I mean? So, um, I in true boot next style. I it was November. It was November the third. It's funny how you remember. I can't remember the bombs and that, but I can remember dates like that. And it and it funny. And I said I'll meet him. Uh, Bolvental, Jamaica in, which was about you know fifteen twenty minutes from where I lived. Eight o'clock. That was it. So my logic was like you know that if he was up to no good. He wouldn't um, actually wouldn't actually meet me, so I had a few beers, turned up at Borvento, sat in a crowded pub. Um, I went in first. And the first thing he said to me was, "Oh, I I've been waiting. I wanted to make sure you haven't brought, brought any mates along." Yeah, and I just said to him, well, "Why would I bring mates? Why would I bring mates along?" Why? So I said it about my, you know, he's been shagging my wife. Straight out, you know, very loud actually in the pub because I, you know, I, had a, I, I thought, no, you, you know, I'm not going to do this quietly. And um, he said, well, no, 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 no. We've been for walks. I supported her. I know you lost your friend. la de la de la And I said, well, I'll ask you again, you know, have you been having an affair with my wife? And he said, no. Now, this guy was overweight, bold, and 24 years older than me. He's married, had three kids. So I said, you're married? You know, because I asked all the questions, married, got children? Right. So I was trying to build a picture which, which actually would not, you know, support my gut feeling, I suppose, for want of a better expression. So that was on the Tuesday. Then on, then on the Friday, we had the um, the free drinking session courtesy of Plymouth you know the victory parade and the pubs were open and you got lashed up the hill so I went on the lash with a view that I would um you know stay in stone house or blah 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 or where, wherever I fell and then I just had this feeling about seven o'clock that evening that I needed to go home and I for the life of me I don't know why you know I was out with mates and I just I'm going home 
So, you know, as you did when you were foolish, and I got in my car, drove from Plymouth to, to Tregadillet near Launceston, where I lived. And I got to the app, the bungalow we lived in, and I couldn't get in. The key would not open the door. So it was obviously on a deadlock on the other side. And then Suzanne came out, clearly throwing on her clothes, forgetting to put her bra on, and then just the penny dropped. So I just walked through the house, saw this the, the guy going out the, the window of the spare bedroom. We live in a cul-de-sac. So I knew that to go around to to get to his car, which I assumed was in the pub, he'd have to go around the house. So I just backed up and went through out the front door. He couldn't run very fast, to be perfectly blunt. So I chased him up the road. And, um, you know, he said, you know, do you want to fight over her? And I I said something, something so melodramatic. I just wanted you two to be honest and clearly a pair of lying twats. I just wanted to know the truth. And uh, he put his fish down, so I butted him um, and then dragged him back to the house. And I did drag him. And then I made a point of shouting to all the neighbours who knew what was going on. See this man, you know, you bunch of twats. I was, I was pretty angry to be perfectly honest. And I, you know, I sat them both down and said, right, you know, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. Um, ever. You know, I don't care you sell insurance and what's the first see you, I'll kill you. And I said to Suzanne, get out. I'm going to go and bring your parents. They're going to come pick you up and I want to see you again. So, so that was, that became my, my, you know, that sort of put a, put a buffer between me and, and subsequent issues I've, I've had over the years, you know, up to when I left. So, you know, and then I went on, did uh, 21 years after that, I, you know, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. You know, some of it's pretty boring, isn't it? You know, you do exercise and you think, what the hell's the point? You know, I mean, I think post Falklands, there was a lot of um, people who wanted to make a name for themselves um, who didn't go down south. Um, certainly perhaps staff officers that might sat behind a desk, driving a desk during the war. I felt there was a lot of that going on, which was understandable. Anyway, I I I, I then um, made colour sergeant. I tore my cartilage. Simply, I went to have my cartilage looked at to see if I was P2 again, uh, with a view that I'd do my first straight states trip with 40, which I was really looking forward to. And the consultant said, you know, where'd you work? I said, Norton Manor. He says, well, you don't really want to drive up there. This afternoon for a couple of hours, I said, no, not really, sir. And he said, got any other problems? <clears throat> and by chance, I just said, look, I've had problems with my hips. I've got this pain in my hip and I've not, never had it before. He said, look, go and get some x-ray done. I'm going to go to lunch, come back, wherever, we'll, we'll, we'll do a whole check. So he did my knees, my back uh, and both my hips. And I came back into the, 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 the room and he said, um, I'm sorry, colours, you know, you're out. I mean, not obviously not as blunt as that, but he said, you're out. You've got arthritis in both your hips. He, he you know, my left was, was uh, poor. My right was just riddled, riddled with arthritis. My wife, Sharon's a physio. So I remember going back home and, she said, oh, you, you, you off in September then? I said, no, I'm getting kicked out. She says, you're joking. And she had, you know, she had a treatment room at home. She put me on the bench and I had a look at me, left him. She said, well, that's not too bad, you know. And she looked at my right and she said to me, I'll never forget it, she said, you got a hip of an 80-year-old. You know, so I then had a medical discharge in reflection, the best way to get out, you know, because you do get your, your, your pension in relation to the time that you've done, the, the injuries have to be attributable. Clearly, from age 16, the warm ways knackered my body. Um, I was found at that time to have um, arthritis in the spine, um, lower, lower back. That explained a lot of my back issues. Um, and both my knees were short. I'd already had an anterior cruise ship replacement. Um, so... You know, and I went outside and I was told to get on with it. So basically after that, I I, I decided I didn't want to go into another uniform. I, I wanted to do something 
really diverse. So I, I, I trained as a psychotherapist and I worked as a psychotherapist uh, within further education um, in schools in Cornwall with messed up youngsters, you know, and that was my chosen career. And to be honest, I was, I was good at it. Yeah, I was good at it. So that really is, is for me, is my, is my fucking story. You know, there's no, you know, it's just like what happens. Um, you know, and I wouldn't change any of that. I wouldn't change what happened to me and Suzanne. She obviously didn't let me laugh, did she? You know, at the end of the day, you know, and I, I, I married Sharon. I've been married to Sharon for a long, long time. We've got two lovely girls. We've got grandchildren, you know. So, you know, what men are you, is it? You know, that's not how my life was mapped out. Dave, would you change living in Launceston? No. No. Goodness me, no. Because I, did, what, what, I lived in Tregadelic, which is, you know, towards Bodmin Moor, a few miles outside of Launceston. So when we got divorced, you know, I, I had this big fat lump of money. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to live it. I, you know, I must have been an outlier. You don't want to be an inlier again as a corporal living in the box and stands back. There's no way. So I was able to buy a house for, for 12 grand in Launceston in 1983, 12 grand. You know, and from that, I did it up, sold it, bought the next one for, for um, 26. And then we had the boom, and we also had the interest rate hike. We had the boom, so I was able then to buy to sell that for eighty-eight, um, and keep some land separate as a as a, as a safety net. Um, and I've, and I, and we bought in Launceston for you know one hundred and five grand. You know that was back in the eighties, and you know a huge house. Um, there, there's a lesson there for young Marines, isn't there? I I bought my first box in Crown Hill. Mm. Um, well, between Crown Hill and West Park, bought it for I think forty, which was a lot. As yeah. a, that was the ex, you know that was a lot of money back in the day. That was like the limit of what you could borrow. Yeah, sold it for I don't know what was one hundred and sixty. Um, moved in with my dream girl, and now we've got a. Pl- I'm not going to say it's it's a palace, but we don't care. It's ours, and and exactly. it, we, we we got a garden and we got a garage, and I tinker in the garage with my boy, and we play foot. We've got a football. We made a football pitch in the back garden, and uh, it it it's to all you youngsters out there in the forces. Don't piss it all away. Just get down that get down the bloody building society. Get lie about you more. I I told him that. When I went to Norway, I earned all this extra money. Well, I mean, we did, right? But you know, you gotta like let even though the even though the draft I was in, we didn't go to Norway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but you know, they they're looking to, you know, you're a safe bet as a service person. So. Yeah, of course, of course. So it's uh, yeah, that's a lesson there for all of us. Yeah, and I mean I I told I I hang on to that place in Salt Ash. We, we were in this blooming huge five bedroom, five reception room at Victorian house, me and Sharon when the girls left and went to university and then went to lead their own lives and we were sat in there banging off the walls so we bought a barn out near Callington middle of nowhere and we've been here about 11 years now but in the meantime the market was really flat so I I, I just um, rented the house out of a lovely family in so so and I sold that two years ago, you know, because the market, because everyone wanted to live in the Southwest. So it was just mm. a good time to sell. Um, spent 18 months getting it to up to some sellable standard, um, you know, where it would make the most money, basically, without spending lots on it. And, um, you know, I've lived in a barn conversion. It's got a couple of acres. First thing I did was convert a which is what I'm in now, to convert a, a workshop and a and a hayloft into a and basically another property on the property, which I could do within planning, because as long as you don't have a kitchen and a shower, you can call it an amenity space. You know, what's a kitchen? Well, it, it it's a two-ring burner and a, and a microwave. I mean, we've lived in this space for the last five years. So I did that and then um decided in my wisdom 
uh, six years ago to gut the barn. So I totally gutted the barn and I built an extension on the barn um, and redone the barn. It had a lot of um, uh, damp problems in relation to a lot of the render had gone. So water was coming through because it's block. It, it's, you know, there's no... <clears throat> Uh, so, so I, I, and we moved back in, in, in at Christmas. Um, but I do most of it myself. I, the skill work, like plastering, I won't try. I can put electrics in, but I always get a bootneck company to come and check it over and, and make sure it's all okay. You know, I, 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 you know, I've done most of it, and, and you know, reap the benefit of buying this place at three hundred. We paid for it, but I, I won't tell you what it's worth now. But I wouldn't, I'm going to get carried out from a box here. I love it. You know, look, you know, I have, I have, found you, you found your shang Shangri-La mate. And that's yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, I wouldn't live anywhere else, anywhere else, you know? So, um, Dave, I'm just going to like chip in here, mate. And, uh, 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 look, I've never done a podcast with someone that's been at war, whether that be the Falklands or, and it hasn't cost them dearly in terms of mental health. Um, and that's, you know, possibly glossing over the fact of all of our buddies that have killed themselves or drunk themselves to death. And, and, and so just a simple, like, question, and I'm not trying to be uh, frivolous or whatever the word is, but, like, w w what's the fucking point of war? What, what? Why do we keep going to them? Well... <sighs> If, ev I mean, if everybody that goes to them gets fucked and comes back and either, you know, spends their life in trauma, um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, well, it, I mean, if you if you if you look at the human species as an animal, you know, there, there are. I think, you know, a long time since I taught, I used to teach psychology. Um, the human as an animal has certain traits that were given i can't remember them all but one of them is territoriality which means that that, that you know and for, to, to gain territory and resource for resources it's always been the case mm. always been the case so war is something that happens in in the human and if you look at war really it's been about territory and resources over the last hundred well since time and eternity i mean the way i you know, I mean, the way I see 1982 now, it, you know, older, wiser, and um, spent a lot of time thinking about it is that, you know, we were thrown together by the politics of, of that moment in history in Argentina and, you know, in Great Britain. I'm not saying that what we did you know, was any way was not just. You only have to go back to the Falklands to, to have... The people say thank you, even the people who weren't around that time, to thank you for, for the life they've got. And, and that is incredibly moving and powerful, you know, if you've got any doubts, you know, and I've never had any doubts. But, you know, young men went to fight, as they always do, and as they're doing in Russia and, and Ukraine, young men went to fight for, for, for politicians and the decisions they make. And, you know, Ukraine, about territory, you know. I mean, what, what was... What was um, <clears throat> rack about you know it, it certainly was about oil um and you know to a degree the falklands was about oil because of the resources and about fishing and about and, and about you know most of the squid in the world that comes from the south atlantic you know so let's not let's not be naive about it you know there was subtext to to the war but fundamentally what we did was the right thing i think the problem at the moment you know politically is that i haven't spent a lot of time in Argentina with the play I'm in, you know, what gets spouted out is, 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 is only two narratives. And it is the, the, the narrative of, you know, Argentinians accusation of colonialism and, and the empire, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and Great Britain's response. And what, what I always say, and I've done a lot of press over the years in Argentina, say well you seem to forget the the, the the third party in this and that's the Falkland Islanders the people yeah of course people on the islands you know and, and you know and the, the, what I say to them is let's imagine that your your area of, of, of Buenos Aires I came along and said 
I want to take over this area. I, I want to take over your schools. I want to, how would you feel about that? Because that's what you are suggesting that we do without acknowledging that narrative. And that's as far as I go when I talk about sovereignty, you know, and, and you know, I don't. There, um, I've got to be careful what I say here because we fucking come under attack for fuck's sake. Um, but, well, I'm just going to say it. You know, they, they're still teaching this in their schools like it's a yeah, mega, I, mega, I, mega thing, you know? Yeah, but I... I, It'd be different if, if half the islanders were Argentinian. Yeah, okay, fair one. But it's this uh, historical island that no one really can lay massive claim to, well, because it's a rock in the middle of the sea. Um, but well, it just... I suppose- I, I, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, when this podcast goes out, there will be a lot of interest in Argentina because of the play, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not trying to, 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 to censor this in any way, but the, 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 the bottom line is, for me, and this is my personal view, and I, again, I do speak a lot about this, is that... <sighs> Argentina, the, the, the Malvinas, the Falklands, as they call it, was, historically was used um, by Perón as a way of galvanising um, the nation. Mm. And they lay claim geographically, but if you, if you know the history of their claims to the islands, it's completely different to our history. You look on Wikipedia in Spanish about Malvinas in English, you, you will see that it's completely at odds and 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 but it is used as a as a way of 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 getting support as a political narrative, a political tool. And we're not going to change that. I think, you know, I've been into about 20 schools while I'm with the play and I'm saying I go to schools off my own back with with people from the cast or uh, friends I've got over there and we, 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 we give them all, I give them an alternative perspective on it all, you know, and that's what I do, you know, and it's incredibly powerful. And it's like, to be honest, when, you, you know, I went to a school, 500, the whole school out. And afterwards you're like, you know, you're signing autographs and you're, you're having pictures for the young people because they've never heard anything like it. Um, most people in Argentina, in my experience, um, are too busy getting on with their lives to have too much of a concern unless it suddenly is explicitly brought up politically during elections, et cetera. You do have a hardcore who you, you'll see them on Twitter, you'll see them on, on Facebook, you know, and, and basically talking nonsense. And I, I, will, I will say that they're talking nonsense, you know, with facts to back it up. The Malvinas for me uh, is, for me, Having been there, you know, a lot, you know, I've been over there five times now. And I think about this a lot. And I think it's like a, it's in their soul, right? And it is part of the identity. And that's not the war. That's this idea, in a way, fantasy, because, you know, let's not forget that Gautieri really messed up because during the 1980 and 81, there were talks between Argentina and Britain about how the islands would be shared with a long-term Hong Kong-style handover, et cetera, et cetera. So he really, really did mess up, didn't he? I mean, come on. We wouldn't be having this conversation now if he hadn't made a big faux pas idiot. Dave, can I just say, Hong Kong's really misunderstood. Um, The... The agreement that was signed, the um, Sino Anglo agreement back in the day, it was only for the Northern Territories. It was never for the island. No, no. It was our fucking wimp fucking government. Excuse my French folks, but it's really screwed things up over there for everyone, right? It was our wimp government that just gave the whole lot back. There was never a deal for the island. The island no. was always British. They yeah. just gave, gave it. I mean, you know, I'm being a bit, I use the word frivolous again here, but I mean, I lived in, you know, I lived in Hong Kong for a year and I, I, I get it. You know, I used to have a Hong, Hong Kongers say to me, ah, next year we'll be rid of you British. And I used to say, oh, what, you want your 
fucking yeah, street exactly. signs in Chinese, dear. You? you want your grandma to have to start learning to speak Mandarin, really? And and they're like, oh yeah, sorry, I'm taking a pic. You you you, you know, it, it is a really very clever culture in 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 Hong Kong off off the back of um, British colonialism, and I'm not defending it all around the world, but it no. it, it certainly became just an incredible 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 unique place and of course now you know if you think we've had it bad this last couple of years um uh, they've had it <laughs> you know they've had it like even even worse and 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 they will get it worse and you can't protest in hong kong you just get dragged off and you disappear and um but, but i suppose i i think for me in relation to the Falklands is, is you're not going to change the part of the Malvinas story, the part of the Malvinas narrative, which is actually part of what makes them Argentina. Mm. You can only do what you can do. So going into schools, going to universities, challenging some of the academics, which I've done in university, I said, well, actually, no, that's not actually correct. You know, and I do it in a, in a respectful way. You know, but it's only what they've been told and, and the way in some ways, you know, you know, if we, we were to have someone from China here, the, the, the narrative of Hong Kong would be completely different to the narrative that you've just you've just expressed. Mm. So and we can't change any of that. And I think for me, in relation to what I attempt to do through the press, through TV, radio, when I'm in Argentina, is try and give an alternative perspective. And dare I say, it works, you know. Um, in- what is, Dave, can you sum up the crux of what that perspective is? Because as we know, in, 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 in Argentina schools, they're just taught that it's their island. We stole it. We're the invaders. We're the occupiers. What would you say to Argentinian children? Well, would I say in a school? I mean, I, I, I talk about... Um, I, 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 I talk about... Because they are the future. This is I talk about them being the future of Argentina. So, so if you're thinking of invaded again, and I'm I am putting it in not the terms I would use, obviously invaded again. I want you to, the very simple exercise. I want you to close. I want you to look at the person next to you who's your best friend. This is what I do, and I, and I get them. I said I want you to look into their eyes, stare at each other, and I have to be quite assertive. I want you to close your eyes now. Yeah, and then look to the front. Open your eyes. Your best mate is gone, completely disappeared, dead. You're never going to see that person again. You're never going to experience being young with that person again. And I say, that's what war does. That's what war does. Is that what you want for your future? We need to find another way. I, I talk about the Falkland Islands a lot. I talk about, you know, understanding that, that you know, people's perspective of history is different. I don't talk about sovereignty. If, they, if anyone asks me, could you get asked some really, really, really challenging questions? And I say, well, you know, we have a difference of opinion and it's not about, it's about respecting. You know, most Argentinians I've met, and I've met hundreds of veterans, respect my position on sovereignty and I respect theirs. I, do, I don't think you can do any more because, because it, is, it is part of, unfortunately, what makes them what they are. I mean, I think in a way... In relation to the schools, well, that, that that's, you know, we have no control over that. But I think the opposite, opposite can be said about in relation to how we teach history in our schools. Mm. You know, what we should be doing with young people is giving well, them good we don't, let, Let's be clear, Dave, we don't teach history. We, we indoctrinate them with the fucking bullshit that keeps the status quo. Um, well, I, I suppose, but the thing is, it's it's... And we can't change these systems in place, you know, and I think what for me is important is, is you know, for me, the history of war doesn't doesn't end when the the, the fighting stops. And the, 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 what we ignore is, OK, if you're going to send young men to war, you, you need to be looking at the historical narrative of what happens to young men who become old men within society. You know, going back to a, a, a point earlier is that. You know, to me, and this is from working as a psychologist and the research I've done over the years, is that war has an impact on you. 
It's actually how the degree. Now, you know, to me, it's not as simple as, as, as you know, let's fact, you let, the bottom line is you, you don't have PTSD unless you're diagnosed. But I know lots of people out there who, you know, I think, hmm, you know, you, 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 you've got all the signs of PTSD, but, but the, they haven't got it unless they have a diagnosis for, from a medical professional, the medical model. We need to, you know, give you a diagnosis, otherwise it doesn't exist. But the bottom line is, is, you know, war impacts on people to a larger and lesser degree. And there's so many factors which will determine how they integrate, accept, deal with those experiences. And, and, you know, the medical model for me is too simplistic in relation to, and also what then? Mm. What then? You get a diagnosis, what then? You know, that's the question. And if you look at recommendations for therapy within, within NICE, which is the National Guidelines, you know, PTSD, I'm not so sure, I haven't read it for a couple of years, would not recommend in sending veterans to see me because I don't work within their perceived framework, which is nonsense because I work in a different way then. And they, have, they had a warning that, you know, it could be, they didn't say dangerous, you know, but they, they were saying don't, you know, send the people who used stuff like Dave Jackson and they don't obviously say Dave Jackson, but you know what I'm saying? Mm. And, and that's where it all, I think that's where it, it, it fails veterans because it doesn't, doesn't look at us as individuals. It looked as, looks, looks at us as, as objects, um, not as, you know, with an objective experience. So, you know, A, B, C, D, E, you got PTSD. A, B, C, no, you haven't. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and let, 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 can we come on to that? Sorry to interrupt you, mate, but, yeah, I, you know, this is, I've done the last, I think, five years in my life has been raising money for veterans uh, in various, you know, charity stunts. Um, I studied to master's degree level in the, in the social sciences. So I'm a qualified youth and um, all my degrees in youth and community work. I've, I'm passionate about young people. Um, I went on to study social work and uh, combine like live, work and travel in 75 countries across all seven continents, plus being in combat when I was 19 years old. It, like I have quite a unique view on this, I, I, I think, and I'd love to, you know, I, I think we need to get, get this out there. Because I, I, I feel that you're probably um, seeing life or PTSD the way, certainly the way that, that I do. And if we're not, at least we can meet in the middle and, and hopefully get something good. Um, what I just wanted to say before we leave the Argentinian thing is uh, I, when I recovered from chronic addiction, I wanted to teach street kids in Mozambique bit of a bizarre thing but you know my, my calling was that these kids that were living on the streets over there and and I there was an opportunity to go and to do so I had to study for six months in Norway a, a kind of like they, they they have unofficial universities in Norway they call them folk high schools so I went over there and I'm studying with like 70 lovely people from all around the world my best mate become Argentinian yeah diego right and i always used to think fuck me if we was just six years younger yeah, yeah we'd have been course. down there in the falklands and i've been trying to kill you and yet you're my best mate it's mm. just just insane dave hold hold that hold, let's hold this moment a sec yes sorry dave i was just um, right. telling you my my experience with my Argentinian mate, wasn't I? Yeah. Um, Diego, just, uh, just, just such reality, isn't it? Of um, killing people that really you'd be mates with in a pub. Um, yeah, and I, I think the thing is, is that, you know, 
I've never ever, well, one, I had one incident which was unfortunate where uh, the daughter of somebody lost his life gave me a bad time. But if you think over the last six years, I've been over there getting for 12 to 14 months I've spent in, in BA. N Everyone else, I just you know, I you know, I'm like part of the furniture over there. You know, they all they all take the mickey and say, you know, when are you moving over here? You know, I go to people's houses for for Sunday lunch. It, it's like, you know, I'm you know, with certainly with many veterans, I, I'm I've never felt anything but but a, a, a great deal of mutual respect and love. And I think when you meet a Argentinian veteran for the first time in relation to, to having seen the play afterwards. All I want from you is, is an acknowledgement that they did their best. It doesn't matter whether they're a conscript, whether it matter whether they're regulars, they just want that acknowledgement from another veteran that you respect them and they did their best. You know, and, and that to me is, is, you know, it doesn't matter what the politicians say, it doesn't matter, you know, all the saber rattling. I, 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 I have no control over that. But, you know, I've never had a, a situation where I felt you know, un uncomfortable. I've had Argentinian veterans crying in my arms after the play. You know, that is more powerful and more important than, than some politician gobbing off, to be perfectly honest. Because, you know, and, and if you look at uh, meeting the enemy, I mean, it's been going on for hundreds of years, you know, and thousands of years where uh, past combatants would meet. You know, and it happened after the First World War in the 1930s. So it's nothing new, you know, um, in relation to, to, dare I say, the more traditional uh, combat sort of situation. Um, I think when we, when we talk about, you know, other areas which are not so um, clearly defined, yeah, um, there might be more difficulty, you know, with, with um, veterans meeting current enemy, if, if you understand what I'm saying. I know, and I fully understand that, you know, and I wouldn't want to meet anyone from the Taliban, to be perfectly honest, you know. So, but I think in more traditional, uh, whatever traditional is, of course, there is a long history of meeting, meeting that's combatants. So okay. I, I don't, I don't. You know, the politics can, you know, I have no control over that. So so I don't engage with it because I, I sometimes think it's a waste of energy. You need to be looking at what you can do in a positive way. Have you, know. you have you read Two Sides of Hell by Vincent Bramley? No, I haven't. Oh, my gosh. He really, I think he interviewed six uh, Argent, Argentinian veterans and the the story that comes out is just beyond belief what they went through. Yeah. I mean, some of them were having to abscond from their mountains in the nighttime because they're up there freezing, starving. Their officers were back in Stanley eating all the, you know, eating all the good rations. And they were having to sneak back to Stanley in the nighttime to go through the rubbish bins to survive because they were, you know, they were starving up there. Not That's that's the beauty of the play. What Minefield does, it doesn't, it's not, you know, the, 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 the play Minefield, I mean, for, for people listening to this, the Minefield's been going on for six years now. We've done 190 shows. None of us are actors. We're basically three Argentinian veterans and three British veterans who fought 40 years ago. Simple. And what we do is we tell our story before, during and after the war. So basically, um, and we are good, we're not actors, we're just very, very good storytellers. And, 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 but we obviously do everything to help the other person's story. So we will be bit part actors in another person's story. And it uses multimedia, music, uh, film from the past. We film each other on stage and it's projected onto a big screen. I dress up as Thatcher, then get my kit off to the sound of Don't You Want Me Baby. So it's got everything in it. And actually the first part of the play is really funny because the lines that you say are actually quite funny, but you don't realise until you're in front of an audience. 
And the stories from the Argentinian side, which they tell to their people and around the world, are shocking. And they they cover the same things like lack of food, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, from that perspective, it, it, it you know, Minefield does a very good job at you know, telling the truth. We don't hold back in relation to um, how war impacts on us. And I think the play for me is not about the war. It's actually about what war does to young men and when they become old men <clears throat> i talk about you know some of my mental health difficulties and marcelo who is also diagnosed with ptsd from an argentine perspective talks about his and we do this you know psychology scene where i'm his i'm his um psychologist and he is my client but then that scene gets turned around he becomes my pseudo psychologist by asking questions about my experience it's very very clever um so, yeah, I think in relation to, you know, you can only do what you do, you know, and I think I, I, I use that in most aspects of my life. You know, a lot of things I have no control over. That doesn't mean I can't challenge them. And certainly with my academic work, um, you know, challenging the current research, popular culture and medicalization of veteran narrative, you know, it, it, they to be fair they they do produce the same stuff but in a different form but it doesn't actually in my opinion make a material difference to to veterans and families lives as they go on you know through life and that's my passion i'm lucky enough to get paid to do that at the moment but it that sort of work doesn't stop when i finish a contract with a university i i still do it you know for my soul so to speak mm. What's the name of the play, Dave? Did you mention it? Yeah, the play's called Minefield, Campo oh, Minado in Spanish. You know, there's a lot of stuff on um, on the web, you know, uh, press reports. There's on Lola Arias, that's uh, Lola A-R-I-A-S, on her website, there's a short uh, eight-minute introduction to the play you know just gives you a snapshot of what the play offers and um, there is a studio version we recorded of the last song the last song um it's called the war song very very challenging lyrics um done in a great rock style there's a copy of that on my on my youtube channel um, which I can obviously send the le- links once we've done this. People are interested in listening to the last song. I mean, what the play does, you know, very simply, like any good story, it takes the audience by the hand and, and guides them through your life story. But the difference is, is when we come to do the last song, which is, have you ever been to war? Is one of the lyrics in it. You know, have you ever seen a man on fire? You know. Would you, would you send your sons and daughters to war? Would you, would you, would you? You know, it's a really angry, punky song. It's great to play. I get to do a really good improvised guitar solo in the middle of that. And, and it, it, it's very clever because what that does is then separates us from the audience very, very harshly by saying, you don't know what it's like, you know. And um, very, very, very clever. I mean, we've done 190 shows. We've been around the world and we're very, very lucky to be involved in it. I'm very proud of what we've achieved as non-actors. Um, we we, we uh, did 20 shows in Argentina. We did the first uh, seven shows, then it, up to the April the 2nd, which is their remembrance. So that was a huge show for the Argentines, you know. And then um, they put the tickets on sale for the rest of the shows and they were sold out within three hours you know we're, we're playing to 1200 people over there which is which actors would give the right arm for you know that's not why we do it you know the, the it's about the importance of the story and the importance of seeing reconciliation in front of you and challenging a lot of you know a lot of stereotypical stuff about you know war, war veterans we're just blokes we're just blokes who fought against each other and we're the best of friends now you know David, it's, it's obviously a, a memorable time for a lot of people, the 40th anniversary. Um, what, what, what can we say here for people that might be struggling 
with this? What what what's what's our message to them? Well, I suppose I I mean for me, you. I don't like to tell people what to do. I mean, I, I, I'm quite harsh in a way in relation to pe people who've got clearly problems is because the first thing you need to do is take some responsibility for your own mental health. And I know that's hard. I know that's hard. But you need to, and, and that's a risk. So when veterans come and see me as a psychologist, that's a risk for them. And the risk is that they have a fear of being judged by me because I'm a bootneck. And they might be army, they might be bootneck. You know, I've got a couple of bootnecks I'm seeing at the moment, yeah. No, one aren't, sorry, one bootneck and one army, yeah. Both from Afghanistan. Yeah. So in some ways, there's a risk in exposing that you're struggling to another bootneck. Let's look at it from a bootneck to bootneck perspective. Mm. Because there is a fear of being judged. There's a fear of not being heard. But you have to take that risk. And I know that's tough for lots of people. I know that's tough for lots of people. But it starts there for me. You know, it, it starts in, in, and then look at, you know, and, and I mean, it's, is it, has it changed much? I don't, I don't see um, it changed much for my thoughtless generation to 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 the younger generation and asking for help I, I don't see a lot of difference in you know the fact that i see a broad brush selection of people from northern ireland right through to afghanistan you know and i i'm, I'm i don't advertise I, I you know a lot of my work is word of mouth which i prefer you know but it always is and i get and if we... i had if i had 10 pound for every person who said to me my mate needs help i i wouldn't be driving around 300 quid's worth of old banger would i i'd be you know but it is first do you know it is about taking that risk you know finding some resources to take that risk and reaching out to someone who is recommended by another person and that doesn't necessarily have to be a veteran psychologist stroke mentor stroke oppo stroke whatever you want to call it it, it can be a civilian who, who 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 knows their stuff you know my best therapist I, mean, I was diagnosed in 95 PTSD, depression, anxiety, social isolation disorder, you know, and I've had my struggles. But the best therapist I saw was a 70 year old wise, wise, wise old lady. She was amazing. And she put me on the road to trying to accept that, you know, my nightmares, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, one of the main reasons I, I thought I was being, didn't, deserve any help i suppose for one of the expressionists because i was i i wasn't a gravel buddy i wasn't a gravel buddy why 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 do, should i be asking for help? why should i be making you know making such a fuss you know but it was for me accepting that i have sleepless nights i i do get incredibly emotional at times i i you know and the other thing is i never grieved the loss of my friend you know until I went back down to Falklands and had to symbolically say goodbye to him on the edge of St. Carlos water before I could move on with that, you know. And then I acknowledged the fact what a great friend he was. And that makes me sad, you know. I mean, it still makes me sad. You know, a young man. And I'm, I'm, I'm alive now. I'm, I'm, I'm doing things which he can't do. But that goes for anyone who loses a life in, in, in war. Do, do, do you think he's bothered about that though dave i'm sorry to be so blunt but it it what would he want for you it, it, would he not well, want I, I know it, i know i i mean i don't think it's about him being bothered because if you you, you, if, you know depending on your religious persuasion for me what's important is what, what I do here and not what happens afterwards. You know, I have no control of that because I'll be dead and I'll be dead and I won't know I'm dead because I'm dead because my brain stopped working. Really, really simple. You know, what happens after that is just, you know, is whatever. It's what I do now. So I don't think you can judge, you know, and no disrespect to, you know, people of a spiritual persuasion. I, I can't judge 
what he would think now because he, he can't. Mm. He can't. But what matters is, is how his friends who knew him see what I might do in his name or what I might do in, in you know, in other veterans' names who've lost their lives, you know, young men. I mean, to me, that's what's important. And that means, which I haven't done yet, as an example, I'm going to the memorial service at, at RNS Yeovilton. You know, I wasn't there in the Falklands War, but I felt that I, I, I wanted to go because, mm. you know, it's in his memory as meant, uh, 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 you know, and the other people who died in the Falklands War. You know, and I'm writing a piece about being a 20-year-old 20, 20 mate. I'm not writing about his military, you know, for, for, for inclusion on that day, you know, and I haven't read it yet because it'd be quite hard to write. But his brother's going to be there. I've never met his brother, Peter. I'm going to meet Doc's brother for the first time in 40 years. So what's important is, is you know, not how Peter sees me, but what I do in, 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 you know, remembering Doc as a, as a great friend, you know, and, and Doc has no say in that, you know, unless you think he's in heaven, you'll, you know. I just, I just want to make the point that you're, you're doing what he would have wanted you to do, mate, is get on, live your life. Of course. Do good for people when you're clearly doing that, you know. And I, you know, I, I, I you know, and, and, I mean, I did a master's and I, and I, I wrote about how's my journey from Royal Marine to council enabled me to ultimately accept my experience of war. And there was no answers to that, but it was an autobiographical reflection on where I was at that moment in time in my life in 2000. And then I paid to do a doctorate because, you know, very simply, I, I was sat on a train coming back from Norwich on my, on my master's. And I, I used to, I just write a lot, you know, and I wrote, actually, no, no one in society asked me as a veteran, brackets, veterans family, what they, what we want from society. It's all reactive. And it still is. It's reactive. It's reactive. It's not building the foundations of something that's really, really proactive in relation to supporting veterans. You know, and I'm not talking about the mad, bad and sad. And I think that they are they are supported as best as possible. I'm not saying it's it's good or bad or indifferent. I, I and I'm not on about, you know, the heroic archetype that gets pushed out time and time again. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the people who sit in the middle who do OK. But sometimes at some point in their life, the deck of cards comes falling down mm. and they won't be diagnosed. But, you know, and that's about, for me, you know, based on the research I've done, that's about, you know, transition and, and a lack of preparation for the nuances of civilian street. We are culturally different to, to, um, to civilians, you know, full stop, end of story. I can, I can give you a lecture on culture and frame any culture and then I could, you know, around the world, then I could put veteran in it and families and we will be the same as coming from a different culture. So where and, we are. And, and, and bootneck veteran is different again. Of course. And then within that, you have your subcultures, you know. I mean, um, so I did, a, I did a doctorate because I needed a voice. And I feel that veterans need a voice um, challenging the status quo. So when I did my doctorate, I did a film about going back to the Falklands on the 25th anniversary, autobiographical very, very honest, very, very, didn't hold back everything I felt. I even noted down, spoke into a camera or spoke in a dictaphone, threw it all together. And then I had to obviously do the academic bit, which argue in why it's important and it's knowledge. And it's never been done before. Um, it was hard. Was it therapeutic? To a degree. But by that time, I, I, I was coming to terms with some of the nuances of... of having a mental health disability. Um, during that time, I had a huge, I had a, my deck of cards came tumbling down for an employment issue where I was stereotyped by Cornwall County Council. I know now so they could get rid of me to save money. And when I'm in it, I didn't realise that. I, was, I did a brilliant job in a school. 
you know, um, no idea because in my employment tribunal, I had letters from parents saying without Dave, mm-hmm. you know, little Johnny wouldn't have made it past into college or into the Navy, you know, but it didn't count for anything, you know, and that I, you know, I, I, I did have a breakdown. I, I looking back, I, I didn't have a breakdown then because I wouldn't admit I was in a breakdown. I ended up in combat stress, um, did the week's assessment. They told me that I have to wait months. I thought I can't wait months to get my, you know, get myself sorted out. And from there I found a good therapist again and, you know, reflected on it. I had to go through a process of being pretty depressed, uh, not working, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, through that, I, I, I needed to find some focus in my life. My focus has been in getting my doctorate, which is the green berry of my mind, and then, then working on projects which I see make a material difference to veterans and actually challenge current thinking within the academic world. Um, there's not, you know, I can spout facts and figures here, you know, as an example, there's 20,000 plus papers written about PTSD and treatment. If you equate that to the economics of doing research, that's a lot of money. There's, there's, there's a handful about families. So, you know, if you look at uh, popular culture, we are framed either mad, bad and sad. We ain't, we ain't framed in a, in, a, in a film like being Mr. Normal trying to do the best or Mrs. Normal trying to do the best they can despite their experiences. And that's, that's where the stories are for me. You know, people who go outside do really, really well. But sometimes... You know, when the when the, the pack of cards comes tumbling down, when they may be redundant, when there might be relationship problems, you know, that's when we need individualized support for veterans. And and you know, I mean, so that's my sort of journey, you know. I mean, I I it took me seven years to get my first job. I was banging on doors, but I just stood on my soapbox. At at conferences i challenged the status quo i was a excuse <coughs> me i was a, i was advisor for lord lord ashcroft report you know that was by just sitting down with them and saying this is what's wrong <laughs> this is what's wrong you know and them actually listening and being included a lot of my stuff was included in in <coughs> in lord ashcroft's report that he did on veterans um you know, and just banging on doors and speaking at conferences, you know, all at my cost and knowing that one day I would get, I would meet someone and uh, who I work with now. She's absolutely fantastic, you know, um, and getting on projects which which I feel make a difference. I mean, I've worked on two. One was called the Military Afterlife Project, um, where I simply went in and said to veterans, male, female, RAF, booty, army, navy, tell me about your life in Sewer Street. That was my research question. And we've got the most amazing data. We, we, we've now got themes which are common across these 50 people. That was done on the shoestring. I was working a day and a half a week. And we've, <clears throat> we've got over half a million words of narrative on a shoestring budget. So it can be done. It can be done, but it's very difficult to get funding. It's very difficult. And the project I'm on at the moment is very simply looking at free chari- small charities turn to starboard veterans and communities, which is um, in Altingham up north um, and Waterloo uncovered and, and just looking at them, putting them on the microscope and looking at uh, the veterans experience, which is for an interviewing process um, getting the veterans within the charities to represent the charity and their experiences of the charity within a film, to do a case study, you know, to say this is your health check to the charities. And then from that, um, a, char- uh, uh, a couple of um, official papers, one for government and one for um, the charity sector, with a view that, you know, I mean, we all know that You know, a veterans charity set up by a veteran, run by veterans with a lot of veterans, not all veterans, a lot of veterans working in. There's a connection straight away. 
I mean, that's not rocket science. But it's getting down to the nitty gritty. What is it about these charities that, that work so well? You know, you know, so I'm involved in that because I, it's, it's a huge project in relation to the potential outcomes from that. So that's what I do. And that's what I will continue to do. My, my wife's retired just as when you're retiring. I said, I'm not. You know, if I'm working, it's like a busman's holiday. You know, so that's, I can't remember what the original question was, but that's sort of what I focus on now. Um, and I will, um, sorry. I'm, I'm just concerned with veterans out there that might be in a bad way. Well, I suppose it, but, but you. <laughs> Can I tell you a little story, Dave? I, I, yeah. I, it, I'm not telling you, although I am telling you, I, ju I just want it for, for our friends out there that. Um, and I hope this helps. But when we was in Northern Ireland, I remember I was on the gate at a camp one day, right? I was on the bottom gate, opening the gate. I think it was Simo, rest in peace, that was manning the, the Sanger above. And the patrol going out, split into two parts. One, one part went out the top gate, so I let them out. The other patrol went out the bottom gate. And within minutes, all you could hear was just gunfire just down the street. I remember looking at Simo going, oh, fuck, right? And that's when we lost Adam Gilbert. Um, Rest in peace. And I, I learned a big lesson from that because there was a corporal, a very experienced corporal with, with Lima Company. I won't say his name because he might not want to be mentioned on a podcast, but if I say a name H, I think people will know um, who I'm talking about. He got shot in the Falklands also. And H was trying to save Gilly's life. And they just looked up and went, index, right? The point I'm getting to, Dave, is like, I, if I'd got in, like involved in all of that, fuck me, I don't think I'd be here. <laughs> right? I don't think I'd be here. I, 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 I always think, what would they have wanted? They, and they'd be like, Chris, dickhead, fuck off and live your life. All right, I can do that. <laughs> That, that that I can do, right? The past, for me, the past is, is about how that impinges on today. Yeah? Yeah. Which obviously with the heightened, I mean, anniversaries to me are a bit of a nonsense, you know, because you, there's not a year goes past where, you, where you, you're not thinking in some, especially this time of year about the problems. I mean, so... You know, and I always say the 40th anniversary is for other people, not for me, because I think about the Falcons on the 39th, 38th, 16th, you know, do you know what I mean? So, so, and I think what happens is there's a heightened, heightened um, stuff in the media. Then next year there won't be anything because, and then we have the normal stories that come out about veterans, which are generally about homelessness, alcohol, you know, the usual stuff. It comes out every year, you know, it's like a, you could set your, them and calendar by it you know and they're not bringing out anything new in relation to stuff but i think the question always for me is how is in past in, impinging on today so if the past impinges in any way on today how, how does how, how does that impact on me moving forward and living a positive life and for me that's always the starting point in the work i do whether that's informally whether that's over a chat with a mate of a beer it's how how and so how are we going to change that? How are we get, how are we going to accept that little part which is which has the potential to drag you down or is dragging you down and you can't move forward because, like you say, life is about moving forward. So, and like I said, I think I think if you are if you are going to regurgitate your story to to as a civilian therapist, there's a huge risk there. There's a huge risk. There's lots of stuff around not understanding not understand me i've heard it thousands of times from veterans who say i went to see this person you know and they didn't have a clue what i was on about so i walked out i've heard that hundreds of times so it is about finding the right person but but it but, 
And whilst it's a risk, I think sometimes you need to stand in front of a mirror, and I mean actually do this, and say to yourself in the mirror, how much value do I place on myself? Because these people might place value on their family. They probably place more value on their dog. But they need to stand in front of me and say, how much value do I place on myself? How, how am I worth taking the risk of going to see someone, whoever that someone is? And that's really tough. But for me, that's always a starting place is, you know, because if they're saying they're not worth it, by not at least engaging, I mean, when I work with people, it's never... I'm going to see you for six sessions. Come along for chat. I might not be the right person for you. Let's see where we go with this. You know, um, and I never say therapy. I never, you know, I will decide in a moment what's best for them. I mean, I've been out on Dartmoor with, with and sat on top of a tour with Flask and some signings and chatted. Now, professionally, is that therapy? Well, it may not be in, in the stereotypical view of a, of a, you know, a leather couch and a couple of leather chairs. No, of course not. But did that support and help that veteran in that moment in his life? Of course it bloody did. We, I mean, we were, you know. As long as you didn't take him to Launceston, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 I you know, in, 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 it's never as simple as, as, as you know, perhaps is made out and the narrative that's portrayed in relation to, you know, you know, come and use op courage, pitch up, you'll, you'll see someone who's skilled in, in working with veterans within the NHS. It's not as simple as that. Mm. It's, it's just not, you know, they, they make it sound so simple that, you know, if it was as simple as that, all veterans would, 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 would have a blip, engage with someone for therapy and walk away and be smiling and happy and move on in life. So, well, it's no, no, life's not, life's not simple for anyone who's had a traumatic experience or, you know, whether that's childhood sexual abuse, rape, you know, even a car crash, it's not as simple as that. Mm. And it's made into this, 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 this um, process, you know, and for me, you know, one, one size does not, does not fit all, you know, that's the other thing that's, that's sadly missing from interventions within the medical model uh, in supporting veterans and families, you know, and then the, 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 you know, I always say that, you know, we are lab rats to be propped and poked by, by academics and the medical profession, you know, and it is changing. I'm probably being really unfair, but for me, I've always felt, well, you know, one size does not fit all, you know, um, you got to ask yourself, can you find something in your life, which helps you therapeutically? Um, you know, whether that's exercise, whether that's drawing, whether that's writing, whether it's focusing, you know, you know, finding something more creative to, to engage with life, you know. Um, and lots of people do it, you know. Lots of people do it, you know. Um, but the question I would, I would, you know, if people are struggling, you need to look in the mirror and say, you know, and actually, the other question they need to ask themselves is, is what, would I, what would I suggest to my mate, my best mate, to do in a situation I'm in? What would I say to him? And repeat it. I, I mean, that, I'm not saying this is not something I'm using as an example. I'm actually saying pe people need to, to really, really look at themselves in the mirror and say, look, you know, what would I say to my best oppo in the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the RAF, if they were telling me the situation I'm in? And then you need to say, you need, this is a, 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 something you do. I would say to them, you really need to find someone who's going to help you out on this. Then ask yourself the question, so how come I'm not doing it for self? Am I less worthy than my friend? Do I think less of myself than I do my best oppo? Because my best oppo would, would, would be really annoyed with me if I'm thinking less of myself than I am on my best oppo. It's really, really... You know, that sounds really simple, but let's face it, there are other complex things that are going on. You know, these things, in my opinion, you know, when people do struggle, do not happen in isolation. 
you know, they do not happen. It's not just something that happens. Generally, there's stuff bubbling underneath. If you, 99, well, a large proportion of us, when we go outside, do okay, despite experiences. And like I've just said earlier, it's generally something else that brings the whole pack of cards tumbling down and underneath you'll see, you know, something that's happened earlier in your life. Yeah, and you can, you can extend that back to childhood as well for some people, you know. You know, you, you know there's no doubt that, that that can be bubbling under, you know, um, poor upbringing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I always say it's not as... It's not as simplistic as it's made out to be. If it was, we wouldn't have the need for op courage, and op courage would be would not be working because ninety nine, you know, hundred percent of us would be doing okay, and there wouldn't be, you know, the issues that arise, you know. Um, but I, I'm a great believer in, you know, you got to find that resource within yourself, that resilience to actually ask. I know it's hard. You know, yeah, it's really easy to be glib in a podcast and say, you know, that, that, that I, I get it. I, I, everyone goes through their own mill. I mean, there's so many things that have helped me for, for a start. Forgive your fucking parents, whatever they did to you or whatever. They've, you you got to forgive that. you got to think what was life like for them. And you're probably going to find they had the same shit that they put on you. And they were struggling and, um, you know, it's like when I look at my little boy, Dave, I'm not seeing a little boy or an, in, uh, I'm seeing me in another body. Mm-hmm. And that is a check for me with my behavior at times, you know, like that is, that is just you, Chris, like when you was a little boy, you know, fucking treat him with some respect and and but it goes the other way it goes back up the chain because very often we find that we've harbored a grudge against someone because they did this to us and did it and yeah it, yeah it's not nice no one's going to say it's nice but when you trace their chain back then you go oh my god they had that done to ah there's a struggling individual was right and and I, it, it it's not about hurting people is ever accepted or anything it's about you've got to move on so somehow you've got you've got to get to grips with it you've got to deal with it put it behind you you know we did a podcast the other day uh falklands veteran came back killed himself and then it came out that you know i'm not going to go won't go into the details again, but he had horrible things done to him in his childhood. Mm. And the Falklands had triggered all that off. That's exactly what I was you know? saying. You know, I mean, I, 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 I think that that, you know, does happen. And, and um, you know, I find more it's something that happens in the here and now. You know, it could be redundancy. It could be relationship problems. It could be, you know, as... You know, I've had situations where, you know, um, some uh, army corporal was killed in Iraq and this just didn't even know the guy. Mm. But the symbolism of loss, the symbolism of, uh, and it just triggered all the stuff that this this army vet I saw hadn't hadn't dealt with, you know. Mm. And that loss went back to the fact that he was close to his granddad and he lost his granddad. And it's about, you know, and it's not wallowing in those things. It's about saying, well, how's that impacting you today? Well, it's impacting you today because you just feel this great sense of loss. So have you ever ever acknowledged acknowledged in some way, you know, your granddad's part in your life and the positive things? And he hadn't. He'd never, never grieved the loss of his granddad so the first thing we did is we found a way in which he could grieve the loss and then 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 move on you know so so it isn't it isn't you know simple and anyone who says it is is filling in a cbt form you know and then filling another one six weeks later i'm sorry you know if life was that simple you know there won't be a need for there won't be a need for the 
in the amount of charities are out there. But that's another narrative, isn't it? You know. Dave, on that note, I'd love to chat with you longer, but if we go on for too long, people will go, oh, hang on, I've got three hours to spend of my day watching no, of course not. But what, just on a final note to all our veterans out there, you know, you were taught to be in a team, right? A team is when you're struggling, you reach out to your buddies and you get fucking help, right? We ain't got time for lone wolves, you there trying to be a hero and deal with it all yourself. That's nonsense. You reach out to your mates. There's plenty of us out there. We've many of us have been 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 for it. You're you're not the first person. Uh, you won't be the last. You got wonderful people like Dave here and all all the work that that he's doing. You're not going to be judged. You're only going to be judged when you know you go and end up taking your own bloody life or something, and everyone goes, "Oh my God, what what?" and and it's awful and and. You know, we've just had that happen in, in the Royal Marines family and I'm still fucking reeling from it because it was like the nicest guy, one of my biggest, biggest supporters of everything that I, I do. And, uh, you know, despite my uh, uh, clinical outlook on life, I fucking shed a few tears for that one, I'll tell you that. But, you know, reach out. We're a team, that's it. You know, you're not a lone wolf. Dave, same goes for you, you know. Um, if anything comes back over this pod, you you get in touch with me and we'll we'll deal with it. My phone is open to my mates twenty four seven. I don't care if you call me. Two in the morning. In fact, I wish some people had done. Um, you know, don't don't keep it to yourself, fellas and fellasses. Um, you know. That's why we're a family. Dave, we're going to put all your links below, mate. So if you can send me like in a nice little paragraph what 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 we can put below that can help people and what can promote what, what you're doing. Um, to all our Argentinian friends out there, hasta luego. And uh, mucho suerte to, uh, to, to all of you. Anyway, thank you very much for the time. It's great. You're welcome, Royal. Yeah. Let's chat again soon. Yeah, all the best. Cheers. <laughs>